Hello everyone, welcome to Thursday. Um, it's Yeah, it is Thursday. It's definitely Thursday. Cool. It means it's editing time. So, hello. Uh, the normal gang are online, which is kind of cool. It's good to see people. Uh, so what have we got? Sharon's on, Ray's on, Pablo's on, Michael's on, Serge is back on, Barry's on, um, Ralph is on. There's a few people absent. We'll deal with them later. But anyway, for the rest of the next hour, we're going to go into Capture One and edit some of your images that you've sent through and talk about some of the things that we might do differently, um, some things that we might do the same, um, and try and get over any issues and questions that you guys have sent in. So before we go any further, the rest of this session will be using Capture One version 21. For those of you with a very keen eye, you will have seen this morning slash this afternoon, depending on where you are in the world, um, there is an update to Capture One 21. Um, it, depending on which which you want to go with the version numbers, it's 14.0.2, which is the equivalent of 20.0.2. Uh, this is the January release. So previously we were talking about the sort of quick service release that came out after 21 was launched. This version adds in some extra support for things like some Nikon cameras, uh, new Fuji pixel shift um, files, a couple of bug fixes and stuff like that. So if you already have Capture One 21, please go to CaptureOne.com and download the latest version. Of course, you can check within Capture One to make sure that you've got um, the, you can do check for updates within the program. Um, but if all else fails, go to CaptureOne.com, just go into your account and download, and you've got the new version. For those of you that don't have version 21, remember we did that pro tips thing um, free on YouTube, so go watch that. It's about 20 something minutes. Uh, I think it's 21 minutes, funnily enough. Um, that will cover all of the new features and updates that are in version 21. For those of you still on version 20, uh, most of what we're going to cover today is still just as applicable to your system. The only bit that really won't um, won't click is the dehaze use if we do that. Um, otherwise, everything is pretty transferable. If you don't have Capture One at all, or you're watching this um, thinking, do I have a go at it? Remember, you can have the trial, so you can download the Capture One trial um, for free. Um, Full or full functioning version, 30 days. Um, again, captureone.com um, and get going with that. So without further ado, let's get into Capture One. Um, funnily enough, who has it said in the... Someone said before we came on, I think it may have been Martin. I want... Oh, there we are. Wet and miserable today in South North Ant or North Ants. Uh, we want some sunshiny pics to look at here. Uh, not quite sunshiny, but we'll start with the sunset um, from Slobodan. So... Um, we're going to go into this this image in a minute, but before we do, I just want to cover a couple of things about the interface because I'm, I'm conscious that we spent a lot of time now talking about specific images, and we've got some new people online, obviously. Um, and there's a couple of things that I do almost, I guess, instinctively, or I'm just used to doing it, um, that maybe uh, maybe need explaining um, to start with. So the first is the workspace. Um, and I'm going to cover two things here. One is color readouts, and the second is a uh, customizable workspace. The workspace that I use in these sessions is intentionally the default workspace for Capture One. The reason being, obviously, I don't particularly want to confuse people when my tabs have different tools available to them to the standard ones. But one of the biggest points of Capture One in general is that you can mold the workspace around how, the, how you want to work. So to a lot of people, for example, um, if you're never, ever going to go into the black and white um, tool, this tool is useless. So A, we can hide it, of course, but B, we can create a new workspace around the way that we want to operate. So it may be that for most of you, you know, we start with white balance, maybe we go into exposure, high dynamic range, and so on. Quite a lot of people only go into this tab, funnily enough, the color tab, to have a look at base characteristics. Well, instead of those extra two or three clicks, we can just add base characteristics onto this tab here. So I can go to these three dots, right click, go to add tool, base characteristics, and it's probably gonna pop down the bottom just there. And I can move it to wherever I want in this panel. So we're not fixed with whatever comes out of the box, we can move it. I can also, on these three uh, little dots, go to move tool to pinned area. So in Capture One, there's two areas on the toolbar. This area at the top, which is pinned, so in other words, it doesn't move. And this area underneath, which as you can see, is scrollable. So if I want something always available to me, then you can move it to the pinned area. So let's just move that one down here into the scrollable area, which means it disappears as I scroll down. One of the most useful things that, that a lot of people actually don't have set up is I do, on every single one of my panels, have 
the layers. And the reason is it's just a consistency. So I know at the very top of every single one of my panels, I've always got layers. I might choose to put histogram as well, but I've always got layers so I can always check the layer that I'm working on just in case, because every time, every now and then we get tripped up. So we, we think we're editing uh, the global change or something like that. And actually we, we might've been on a sky layer or a gradient layer or something like that. So having layers always available is useful. Having the histogram always available at the top of every panel can also be useful, but also consolidating tools onto a panel can be really handy. So that's about how we sort of customize these things. Remember as well, you can also add a tool tab. So you can have another one. We can have a local adjustments tab along the top as well with its own set of um, things. Now I know a lot of people, of course, these have got their own names, but a lot of people will use them to their own preference um, and decide which they want to call each of these tabs um, and create their own workspace. And then of course your workspace can be saved. So that's the, that's the tools as it were. But what about if I'm over here in the image and I don't want to keep looking across over here and let, let's imagine I've got my levels here or curve here or histogram. Let's say my histogram isn't on the screen. Let's just remove that from this tool. Well, maybe I'm zooming into this area here and I want to keep an eye on what that's doing to the histogram. Well, under your window menu, you can create a floating tool. Now you can actually do this in two ways. One is we can create a floating tool and say, I want the histogram and it generates it here. And these tools can go a little bit bigger than the, uh, than the standard ones because you have a bit more view of uh, exactly what's going on across those different levels. The second way of doing it, I can drag this across and actually I can put it back into that pinned area. So just in the same way I can drag a floating tool into the pinned area, I can drag a histogram tool out. So where this is really useful is if I'm zooming in somewhere and I just want to keep an eye, let's say I'm making a change to our exposure and I want to keep an eye on exactly what that's doing to the histogram at the same time, I can do it with that floating tool. Or, here's a really handy one, levels. So the levels tool is a little bit compressed in here. Same with curves. Let's pull it out. All of a sudden, whoops, clicked in the wrong area. All of a sudden, now it's a floating tool. I've got all of this extra space so I can see in a lot better detail what's happening with my histogram data. And it is the same tool. It's exactly the same tool that's on the left-hand side. It's just now floating. If I want to get rid of it, I can either drag it into the side or just remove tool and off it's gone. Um, and of course you can save these as defaults per camera as well. Um, oh, sorry, you can change the, the levels default, sorry, per camera, not necessarily the, um, the tool. Um, but essentially your workspace in Capture One should be designed around you and the way that you work. So if you're never ever going to go into the color grading tool, because that's not what you do, you do, you know, literal photography or architectural stuff, maybe you get rid of the color tool out of your, your um, tool set, or you put it onto a different tab that you don't use so often. If you never, ever, ever use the dehaze tool, get rid of it. You can remove it or you can move it onto another tab. But either way, you can absolutely mold this around how you want to work with Capture One. And that's really important because quite often we see people, you know, how do I, for example, how do I get all of my pictures up in one go? Well, let's just go to uh, all images in my browser. I can hide my viewer and go into there. And I can bring my viewer back again. So in my case, it's pressing the G button and we get up to all of those images. Um, I can put my browser at the bottom. So let's go view under browser. I can customize it and place below or you can do the shift command and B and that moves the browser from the right to the left. Again, customize browser, place right. It's the same um, shortcut, shift command and B. So the browser moves from right to the bottom. We can place the tools on the right and the tools on the left and so on. But the most important bit for me, as I say, it's not about, is there a right way of having it? And actually I just saw someone's um, asked in there, where were we? Uh, can we have, oh, and Andreas, uh, can you share your workspace? Here's, here's the, the, the reality. No, because my workspace is set up how my brain works and it's set up how I edit photos. Your workspace needs to literally wrap around the way that you edit photos. I'm happy, you know, I can I can tell you the tools that are essential from a landscape point of view and from a portrait point of view, but really you've got to work through the process that you go through on a photo. And think about this. If you're always doing certain things in the same order, so if you're always starting with base characteristics and then you move on to white balance and then you move on to 
uh, let's say you do levels next. Why put your levels down the bottom here? If you always do levels after you've done white balance, let's just move it up here. So now this is in the order that I'm working. And the key bit is don't have the defaults. So, so the defaults are a great way of, of getting started. But once you've started editing lots of photos, you will know in your own mind where you keep going backwards and forwards to different tools and design your workspace around you. It's one of the most powerful features of Capture One. It's one that's sadly overlooked quite often. Um, okay, second one. Um, it's just a little fun one because I was I was talking to someone uh, yesterday and we were playing with this um, and, and funnily enough, they didn't actually know it existed. So let's have a little look at uh, an area in here. So let's say we want to see whether this is underexposed. Uh, let's just pull it down so we can see that it is. Okay. Now, we always talk about these numbers at the top of the screen. So, of course, in Capture One, whenever you're moving the mouse around an image, it's going to give you a readout at the top, red, green, and blue, and the luminosity of that pixel. And, of course, it's not necessarily an exact pixel because, obviously, that mouse right now is covering more than one pixel. But it's giving you an approximation of, of what you're seeing. So, as I move my mouse around here, 3, 3, 2, and 3 luminosity, that's pretty dark. Okay, so what if I would want to keep an eye on this while making some changes to tools? And that's going to be a challenge. Now, one way is we can use speed edit. So obviously, if you use the shortcut keys and then drag your, or scroll your mouse up and down, then we can avoid having to go over to the tool space. But the other is a bit more accurate. At the top here, we've always had this white balance picker. So I can choose a white balance in the image by choosing different areas. And it's going to do weird things because I've just told it to white balance off of a palm tree. But hold the mouse down over here, and you'll find one that says Add Color Readout. When I click now, I'm now going to get a permanent color readout of this palm tree. Let's move around, and I'm going to add another readout there. That's a permanent color readout of that area of the sky. We can zoom out, and let's go into here. And we'll say, click on there. There's another color readout. To go back, I think June's just said, um, can't get the white picker to work. It may be, June, that you're actually up here. Just go back to your pick white balance as the default tool on there, or press W on your keyboard. That should go back to your um, your white balance tool, hopefully. If not, let us know, and we'll, um, we'll have a little play and see if we can replicate it. Um, but these permanent features now on this picture mean that as I start changing things, I get actual readouts of what that's doing to those places. I don't have to keep putting my mouse over these different places and hoping I've got the same area, same pixel, same um, portion of the image. Those things are locked in place. Now, bear in mind, they are literally locked in place, and they're basically uh, based on your session. Session's the wrong word, but your time in Capture One. So in other words, if I go onto another picture, those readouts stay in exactly the same place. So be aware of that. It can be handy going from one picture to another if you're trying to normalize images and make sure the same area of the picture is the same color. But they are going to stick across different images. So to get rid of them, well, we can go back into either your Add Color Readout and then hold down the Option key, and it becomes a Delete Color Readout. Or you can go up here and go to Delete Color Readout, or you can use the shortcut keys um, on the right. But the key thing for, for me with this is, if you start thinking about how we edit pictures, a lot of the time we're doing it by eye, but we're, we're hoping that we've got the bright part up near the 255, but not beyond. We're hoping we've got the shadow down at zero and not beyond. Well, this way and this method of working means that if I go into my levels and I overdo it a little, well, yeah, I could move my mouse over here. And let's say I move my mouse here and say, look at the top numbers up here. Oh, we're good. 16, 2, you know, 14, 7. That's not... It's not underdone here, even you know, there's still one, one, two, one. It, you know, we're not we're not below the shadow level. But on the place that I knew was the darkest place originally, we're at zero, zero, zero. So we've pushed it too far. So these are a really, really, really handy way of keeping a, a, a track on what's going on in the image, regardless of what tool you're in, regardless of where you are in the picture, they stay anchored to that pixel that you clicked on. So there we go. That's that's our intro for today. Two little quick um, quick tips. Number one, please, please, please customize your workspace. It is so powerful to do this stuff. Um, and and when you do customize it with adding tools, removing tools, you know, removing tabs. If all these tabs get on your on your nerves, if you never ever use a process recipe, 
you can remove that tab, the output tab. You don't need it necessarily. Of course, do it based on what you want to do and the way that you work, and you're going to need some time to work that out. But once you've got that nice little method set up, design your workspace around your way of working, not the default capture one. Of course, if you want to do it around the default capture one, you can. It's not a bad starting point, but you will find the more and more you edit, the more you want to change. Okay, um, and as for those color readouts, yeah, we don't generally use them in these sessions because um, we, we're doing a lot of this by eye and we're trying to, to bring people along with us. But especially when you're grading, if you're going between two different images and trying to make sure that the same area is the same color um, across them, then just make sure that um, you, you're aware of that tool because it's really, really handy. Okay, um, so this shot, uh, Slobodan's on, I think. I saw a message saying he's online. Um, yep, so, right, let's get started on this. So obviously it's a sunset or sunrise, either way it's a sort of a golden hour um, approach. And, um, oh, sorry, let me just, I've just missed a couple of questions. Um, so one of them, uh, what would be the right parameters on those numbers on the colors? Uh, in terms of right parameters, so it, it's not a case of what's right. Um, it's a case of, in an ideal world, I never want any of those numbers to be above 255 because it means that the that channel, red, green, or blue, has overexposed. It's gone beyond the visible range um, up to white. And I never really want them below zero. That said... If I want to crush shadows, in other words, I want real deep, solid blacks in a, a dark area of a scene, there's no problem with them being zero. That's your choice. Likewise, the middle of the sun, if you're shooting into the sun, the sun is a big, fiery gas ball of explosions and stuff. It's actually quite normal that if you put a picker in the middle of the sun that you've shot into, it's going to be zero or 255 all the way through because it's overexposed. That makes sense. Um, but... Generally speaking, other than those two sort of situations, you really want things within the range of zero and 255, um, which is our visible range on a histogram. Okay, so let's uh, just move into this image. Um, where are we? Uh, sorry, one question that just came up. I just saw the other question um, from Deepak. How do we save a workspace like that? So on your window menu at the top of the screen, um, you'll find one that says workspace. It's the same area where you create the floating tool. Once you've set your workspace up, you go to save workspace and it will save it into your preferences. And you can actually, you can see on here where we've um, gone from 13 to 14.0, 14.01. These are the default ones. But you've also got on there the function for dual monitor, which is nicely set up by Capture One. But again, even with the Capture One um, versions, you can choose that as a starting point, make changes, and save it as your own custom workspace. That's the whole power of it. Okay, um, let's have a little play then. So moving into this shot. First off, the first thing I want to do actually is crop it, um, to be honest. Um, this, this foreground here, it gives me a lead up into it, um, but there's nothing really that interesting in this foreground part of the shot. So what I am going to do, and in the spirit of one of the Facebook uh, group questions that came up the other day, about why do we do unconstrained versus constrained. Honestly, the reason that I do constrained is because when we're selling prints, it's just easier. Customers can understand the constraint. They understand two by one, three by two, um, four by five, and so on. They're also standard frame sizes. So we would normally always offer a print with frame, um, but some customers choose not to, and it's gonna be easier for them to, to get a frame that's a standard size than not. Um, if I'm honest, the, uh, the higher end you go, the more expensive you go in terms of both frame and print. Typically, things tend to be a lot more customized anyway. But it's one of the reasons why we stick with the standards. But there is no law that says you have to. If you want something which is 5.3 by 2.8 as a, as a ratio, you can do that. Not a problem at all. Um, so don't get too hung up on, on sizes. If you're showing for screen, remember... Um, you might find that uh, 16 by 9 is a more safe option for you. Um, but in general, don't get hung up too much on, on the shape. It can be whatever you want. Um, David's just asked, that's a good point, actually. So do you think that if you deleted the whole tool tab, you might just forget that the tools are there? You might do. And this is why I'm saying use it for a while. Get to your way of working um, to the point where you know what tools are available to you. If the tool tab doesn't bother you, then then why delete it, of course? 
Um, but if it's something where you've moved everything into one tab, which I've seen um, some people do, um, others have got literally a tab for each step of their process, and they just happen to use those icons. Um, all of those are viable ways of, of customizing your workspace. But yeah, absolutely. If, if you're not too sure about what's available in Capture One, then you know, let's imagine you forgot there was a film grain option. Well, if you'd remove the details tab, which I wouldn't recommend because that's where your sharpening and noise control are, but if you had, you might forget that you had film grain in there. You might forget that you had more correction um, at the bottom as well. Um, okay, so with our set here, nice little crop. Um, to me, this just feels a bit more intentional as a crop, um, a bit more purposeful. So let's have a look at our white balance first. Now, we could, of course, start with our base characteristic and we could do the old, uh, let's start with linear response. But here's the challenge for me. If I start with linear response on this shot, what's the first thing I'm going to want to try and do? Well, it's going to be to, well, I guess, integrate some extra contrast, right? We're, we're going to try and um, we're going to try and boost it. We're going to try and lift it, and probably do that with a curve. Well, how about we just stick with the auto curve to start with? And the reason that I'm happy to stick with the auto curve is we have no information which is overexposed or underexposed in this shot. So it, the, the linear response curve is wonderful if we want to um, compress that histogram back into our visible range, so from 0 to 255, because it tends to flatten the image, calm down the highlights, you know, lo or loosen up some of the shadows and get them away from being crushed. But that's at the expense of any contrast, so you're flattening the contrast in the shot. As a result... I come at this from two different angles, depending on what the shot's like. If the shot has extreme contrast and blown highlights and blown shadows, for example, start with linear response and then start adding in contrast where you need. If it doesn't, and the content of that histogram fits quite nicely in the middle of this range, which this one does, auto is going to do no harm whatsoever. Um, and actually what we can do with auto, you can get to roughly the same place from auto down as you can linear um, up. So on this one, we're going to start with auto because I like what it's done with the contrast already. That said, um, we need to have a look at the, the white balance here. So what I'm tempted to do is warm us up a little bit. I'm not sure where this was shot, Slobodan, if you're on, but um, I may have missed that in the message. If I did, I'm sorry. Um, however, um, let's try and warm it up a little bit. Let's try and uh, to get it feeling a bit more uh, where Mediterranean slash um, somewhere a bit nearer the equator. Um, that to me works. This is personal preference. Tint is normally used to correct for color cast in filters, but it can now be used creatively, of course. And this is only one element of your color correction. The other element, of course, being on your color tab as a default, um, which is in here as your color editor and also your color balance. So color editor allows us to pick on a color and make a change. So if I want to pick on this color down here, I can go into my little picker tool and it's picked out that it's orange. If I go into my advanced tool and choose that, it's going to give me a lot more control. So I can say, actually, I want to really spread out anything that's even close to that color um, and have some nice fall off. So think of smoothness on the color editor, like feathering in, in that sense from, from the areas that go um, from included to not, um, we can shift the hue. So we can make that change to be a little bit more greeny yellow, or we can make the change to be a lot more sort of pink um, in that sense. Uh, we can change our saturation, but only for that color. And of course, we can change our lightness. Now, of course, if I turn this little button on here, the view selected color range, what this does is it actually removes anything that's not included in that color range and puts it into gray. Now, this is quite a broad color range that I've got here. So if I narrow this down, so with view selected color range on, we can actually see the areas that we're affecting. Everything else is actually then effectively desaturated in black and white. So this shows us here, we're affecting this part of the tree, but not that. So the color editor as a tool, wonderful tool, but on selective parts of the image, certain colors, definite areas of color within the image itself. The better option, if we're talking about global changes in, uh, in an image, is actually the color balance tool. 
So what this does, it doesn't look at a specific part of the image or a specific color within the image. What it says is based on its luminosity, change parts of the image in terms of how they feel. So we could say our shadows, the dark parts of the image. So as I move my mouse across, we get our nice orange line on the histogram that tells us where that sits. This is all in the shadows. Let's say we want our shadows to be a bit blue. Okay. And what about our highlights? Well, our highlights here are pretty much going to be the sky and the sunshine. So let's move our highlights into a slightly warmer place, maybe around here. Let's go with that. This along here on the left, and the same thing that goes from the center to the outside is controlling effectively your saturation of that color, or the amount of that, that hue that we're, um, we're shifting. Um, so let's go to about there. And our midtones. So our midtones are pretty much going to be all of this stuff, the concretey stuff, the grays. And of course, we can shift those as well. So we can go from green across to pink, which is almost like our tint. But remember, in your exposure tab, your Kelvin and your tint apply to the whole image. Unless you've masked it, and of course we can do that, but any change I do there is indiscriminate of whether it is a shadow, a highlight, or a midtone. makes no difference. It's going to shift it to be cooler or warmer, pinker or greener. In our color balance tool, we can separate those out as shadows, midtones, and highlights and treat them differently. So the color balance tool is not the same as white balance. It's actually shifting the color of that range of luminosity in the histogram effectively to be, in this case, more orangey red if it's a highlight. In the midtones, maybe we go for a bit sort of cyan -y blue. And in the shadows, we can go fully blue. And we end up with what, what we'd refer to as a split-toned image. Split-toned images can be really funky and, and creative. Um, if you get them wrong, they can look really hideous. Um, but it gives you a whole different feel to what you can achieve with white balance. White balance is actually quite limiting um, in, in this sense. So if you get into the realm of color grading rather than correcting the, the recording or the capture, the color balance tool is the more powerful tool for you. White balance itself, we generally use just to correct um, for any issues that were taken at the time that it was shot in terms of the temperature of light. So I'm just going to pull this down a little bit. I'm not resetting it. I'm just pulling it in um, so it's not quite such a, a heavy change. Right. Now, what about this sky? Well, let's start off with a new layer, and I'm going to call this sky. I don't have to do that because the first time I create a gradient layer, it would have created a layer for me. But in this case, I just want to make sure that I've called it a name so I don't forget. And on here, if I put my mask on, so press M for your mask, um, that will show you the mask in red down to clear. So remember on a gradient, this first line is 100% mask. In other words, everything that way is going to be 100%. Everything here is 50. Everything here is zero. So anything beyond this line here is going to be no effect of that mask. The distance between here and here determines how quickly that falls off. And you've also got the option in Capture One to hold down the Option key or the Alt key. And I can make this asymmetrical. So I can say, actually, I want it all fallen off by here, but I want a nice longer fall off on this top part here. So it doesn't have to be even either side of it. Uh, sorry, one question what was it Peter just asked? What's the what is under the tool tab with the brush icon next to the output tool tab? This one. Uh, this one, I just added in the extra tab um, of, I think it's quick. Where are we? Quick, I think it was. Or maybe, no, it was local adjustments. Sorry, it was the local adjustments tab. Um, it's just a different form. I'm just going to remove that tab to uh, not confuse it. It's a different form of, it's a collection of tools that you were useful for local adjustments. Now we have layers, um, that tab becomes a little less important to me, I have to admit, um, but a lot of people still um, still keep it. Um, okay, so where are we? Right, our curve. Let's remove that mask, so press M again on the keyboard, and I can pull our exposure in a little bit. Now, don't do this too much. Um, I see this quite a lot. Uh, the problem with this, if you've got an area below the sky that's reflecting light, it does not make sense that the reflection of that light is brighter than the light was in the first place. It is not possible, as far as my awareness of physics goes, for the sea to reflect light from the sky 
more than the light that was there and available in the first place. So if we are going to do any adjustment change, make it so small, and that's a third of a stop, and that's plenty for the sky. I might choose to bring my highlights down a little bit, which means that we're removing actually this palm tree from that change because this palm tree is in the darker areas of that mask. So even though the mask goes over the palm tree, this change isn't going to affect it, nor is the white one. If I pulled up shadow, then it would. And you'll notice it's only affecting the palm tree. So this is quite clever if you think about it because I haven't had to do anything like a luma range. I haven't had to choose certain luminosities in the, in the image. Because I've got this mask over here, that mask is controlling the fact that we're making changes to everything that's in red. But if I stick to my HDR tool in this case, because I've got an area which is very definitely in the shadows and in the in the black zone of, of the histogram, and an area which is actually in the highlights and the white zone of the histogram, by changing these sliders, I'm actually able to separate out the two parts of this image. So in this case, I could lift that tree just a little bit, not too much, um, pull the highlights down, pull the whites down fine, and that's sort of it. I'm going to leave it at that. And then out here, one thing, there's a couple of things that sort of annoy me a little bit. We've got our healing brush tool. It's the one that looks like a Band-Aid up here. Um, we're going to choose 100% opacity, 100% flow. In most cases, that's going to be the case for your healing brush. Um, very rarely would you want to heal any part of um, an area. And I'm also going to get rid of this little uh, line here. Because I want to make sure that this line is carried on, I'm going to drag the origin down to here to continue that on. So that just cleans up that side there. I like these steps in there, so we're going to leave that in there. And then if we wanted to, on our background layer, we could go a little bit, it's a traditional way of doing it, but a little vignette um, just to highlight it. So then we go from there to there. Um, if we want to make the image pop a bit more, because where we've sort of subdued things um, just in the, uh, in the sky area, if we want to take the whole image and just lift it, we can use our levels of touch. Uh, and in here, but just remember one thing. Everything that we've just done in terms of pulling down whites and highlights, pulling up shadows, we're undoing a little bit if we then use those levels to pull in the histogram. So while levels is affecting the whole image, not just the sky layer that I drew, and it's affecting literally the whole of the histogram rather than just that particular range, just don't undo all the work that you've just done so if you spend all your time trying to recover all the highlights recover all the shadows and then you go into the levels tool and say right blow the highlights out and, and um, crush the shadows doesn't make any sense um where are we uh from Vern, does capture one achieve subtle variance adjust or vibrance adjustment in its saturation slider without a very a vibrant slider unlike lightroom um, so my my take, or my first take on it, the saturation slider in Capture One is quite brutal, or it can be. Um, if you overdo it, you know, oof. Um, but then if you overdo saturation in any program, it's going to be the same. Um, if you want a more subtle change to saturation, I'd go into the color editor um, or the color tab, go into your color balance, or maybe you just want to saturate one particular color. So let's say in our advanced color editor, um, Let's just choose that part of the tree and just expand it a little bit. And maybe we want to increase the saturation just on that green. I'd do it in there um, to be more selective rather than um, just as, as a global saturation change. But in this shot, I think it's better um, without so much saturation in the first place. Okay, so yeah, if we go, uh, let's create a new variant. So we go from this shot, mm, um, to something that could work as a sort of, I don't know, holiday postcard, border, whatever, um, with a few, and again, reminder to everyone, um, for those of you that have been on here for a while, you know that I bang on about this, but little changes cumulatively add up to a huge difference. So just, just really be careful that you don't push it too far um, in any one tool. Big reminder here, every time I put my mouse on one of these sliders, I risk my image. So use the least number of sliders and tools that you can to get the effect that you want. Don't just click on everything just because it's around. Okay, um, let's go on to a shot from Stefan. So this one, I know this place very well, this is Singapore. Um, 
So let's have a little look at our cityscape here. So Stefan's point on this one was around the fact that the sky was a lot more vibrant, a lot more vivid. Um, so we've just got to be um, aware of that when we're doing this edit um, and what we can do with the city in general. So, uh, sorry, I just missed one question from Erwin. Does using individual colors in curves have a role in color grading? Yes, it does. Um, so one thing to, to bear in mind, um, on your curves here, remember your curve has shadows, midtones, and highlights. So if I click on the red um, channel and say, I want to do that, what I've actually just done is increase the reds or the, the steer towards red on my shadows. If I pull it down, then I've decreased the reds in the shadows. In other words, made the shadows more green and blue. Likewise, on the highlights, I can make the highlights more red or I can make the highlights more green and blue by playing with the red channel. So absolutely, yes, you can use the individual colors on a curve to do your color grading, frankly. Um, it's just the, the way that Capture One have exposed it in the color tab here, this color balance and the, the three wheels is really handy. And actually it, it also helps with things like understanding complementary colors and stuff. Having that visual wheel helps a lot of people. So I think my preference if you're color grading would be to use, you know, start with the master one if you want to, because that's the equivalent of shifting the colors um, for the whole image, just like to a certain extent white balance. But of course, you can go into the three way, the shadows, the midtones, and so on to achieve what you know, ultimately you could argue you can achieve with a curve, because that's what it's, it's affecting, um, but just a little bit easier to do. Okay, uh, let's have a play with Singapore then. So, um, first off, this is obviously the original image. Let's go into our um, lens tool, so our lens correction tool, where we'd always try and start. At f9, we might have a bit of diffraction, probably not, but um, let's have a look. If we do, let's turn that on, see if it gets any sharper. Actually, it does, so we'll leave that on. Again, I'm not blindly just clicking diffraction correction. There is not a, you know, oh, because it's above f8, we must click diffraction correction. Different lenses behave differently, different camera formats behave differently. Think about what that correction's there to do, and if you need it, turn it on. If you don't, then you don't need to turn it on. Same with things like purple fringing. So in here, if I turn this on, it has corrected a little bit on the edges of these buildings. Where you're going to see diffraction and fringing typically is at high contrast points, and especially towards the edge of the, the image. So in this case, I am going to leave it on um, with a bit of fringing correction too. So our lens profile is loaded in. This is the default profile for this image, and Capture One has decided that at 25 millimeters, this 16 to 35 lens doesn't need any distortion. If we want to override that, then we can do it, but you can see my manual distortion started bending those buildings, which doesn't make sense. So actually, we're going to leave it to what Capture One has said. Now, don't misunderstand the difference between diffraction and lack of sharpness. So you can have lenses that diffract at a small aperture, and that will lead to a slightly soft edge around um, those, those lines. But you can also have lenses which are less sharp at the outside. But sharpness fall off is not the same as diffraction correction. Sharpness fall off will, it's effectively a vignette, and it's going to sharpen the edges more than it sharpens the middle. So in this case, if I turn that on, I've got a middle here. Let's just go to maybe 200%. A middle here which isn't that sharp now in comparison to the edge which is now tack sharp and the reason is I've turned on a huge amount of sharpness correction unnecessarily. The sharpness in this image actually is pretty uniform from left to right. If I turn that on this is sharpness fall off. It's not a sharpening tool for the whole image. It's sharpening the edges of the image not the middle. So by introducing it where you don't need it, what you'll end up with is, is an image that's sharper at the edges than it is in the middle. That doesn't make any sense. So use this when you need to. If you've got a lens that's particularly soft at the edges, turn it on. If you don't, then you don't need to use that tool. Not a problem. Um, one other question. Where are we? Uh, do you think there is a... Sorry, it's from... Uh, I don't know how to say that name. I'm sorry. Um, how do you, how do we pronounce that name? Um, do we think there is a need for external software to deal with noise like Topaz D noise? Um, Capture One itself has noise reduction in it. 
as, as some of you all know, um, quite vocally, I'm not a fan of a lot of the Topaz tools. Um, I've seen some quite damaging effects of things like Gigapixel and, and the, the sharpening tools and so on. Um, however, sometimes I, I agree, actually, Capture One's noise reduction needs to get better. Um, it, got, it got very good, actually, compared to version, where are we, 12, I think, in version 20. I think it was 20. The noise reduction got a lot better. It was either from 11 to 12 or 12 to 13, which is 20. Um, the noise reduction got a lot better than it used to be. Um, so now it is it is good. What it's not designed to do, and this is going to sound weird, it's not designed to fix a very noisy image. It's designed to reduce noise that's part of the natural process of a high ISO or you know, a, a hot day and you've got some, um, some pixel noise coming out of it or a, a stuff that's in the shadows. What it's not designed to do, um, which is what some of these other tools claim they can do, is take a completely wrecked image with way too much noise and clean it right up. The problem with noise reduction is effectively it is a form of blurring your image. Whether it's called AI or not AI or whatever else, ultimately what it's doing is it's taking a cluster of pixels, working out what the overall tone of that, that group should be, and then softening and smoothing that effective noise. The problem with doing that is you do lose sharpness. So then what they do is they then introduce some contrast to add in some sharpness overused those tools can be really damaging because they, they just make the image look false um so my my general view on it is shoot for the lowest noise possible um so ideally as lower iso as you can get away with um then you don't need to do it if you do need to do it then yes there are let's call them rescue apps out there that will help um but personally I'm not a fan of that one the the one that i have had good results from um when i've played is uh, it's, uh, the company is called Imagenomic, and they produce two very good plugins, actually. One is called Portraiture, um, which is a skin plugin. With what's going on at the moment in terms of whether retouching is good or bad, um, that's a debate point as to whether or not you want to automate skin retouching. But they make one called um, Noiseware, um, so Imagenomic Noiseware. It's a plugin for Photoshop, um, I think for other things as well. I don't know whether it's standalone. But it's... It does a good job and has enough control um, if you don't push it too far to look um, to look real. Um, where are we? So, oh, there we go, Jim. I very rarely do any adjustments to sharpening or noise reduction on my Fuji images. Maybe it's 32 or so. Yeah, and and to be honest, um, it's rare that I have to pull down. Typically, one of the reasons that people are seeing a lot of noise is because they're underexposing the image. Um, so when you pull up a lot of detail from the shadow whether it's a high ISO or not, if it's well under its exposure level that it needed to be, you are going to bring up noise with it, unfortunately. So there is an argument that says, you know, maybe a bracketed exposure would have helped. Maybe the use of a filter would have helped. Um, lots of different tools, but I would look at noise reduction as a last resort rather than a, um, a, a standard tool. Uh, there we go. Um, oh, David, 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 can film grain help disguise ISO noise? It can. Um, but I'm not sure I want to do that. Um, but yes, in, in theory, you know, anything that's going to um, you know, disguise any ISO noise, yes. Um, there are different tricks and different ways of doing it, but um, it's that, that is one way that I've seen people do it before. Okay, um, so let's go on to our skyline. First thing I want to do actually is crop it. And unlike before, with our unconstrained one, we're going to go to a one by two, maybe a two or one by three but no one by two is pretty good i'm just going to come in on this left hand side for no reason other than i, I just want to balance up the scene I'm, I'm also debating whether or not i lose this building on the right but i think we'll leave it there as it is for now pretty sure this image is level and straight um, we could measure it we could check it we can use um, this building in the middle i'm just going to um, zoom in to here and draw a nice little straight line down here. I'm assuming the building's straight. Um, yeah, okay, so we've got a little bit of a shift, um, but not too much. It's, it's pretty level. Um, and then let's have a look at our white balance. So first thing on our first tab, we can look at our curve, actually, before we do that. So this is the auto curve, obviously. This is linear response. 
a lot darker. One thing to bear in mind, um, actually, for those of you that shoot cityscapes, um, when you look at the starbursts on a light, the auto curve is actually helping that be quite vibrant. So what happens in the auto curve is it's a, it's almost a forced S in there. So it's gonna it's gonna push some shadows. It's gonna lift some highlights, and it's gonna effectively. And that's why it adds contrast. It's a it's a form of a mini S curve that comes out of um, Capture One. If I switch this to linear response, you see how that starburst has changed. And what's happened is I've got a lot more detail back because it hasn't let anything flare or overexpose. But I have to say, I don't like that that starburst. When I'm shooting cities, I want them to look like that. I want them to slowly go from that overexposed area in the center point of the light and smooth out to the, the, the pinwheel that comes out. Linear response does a great job of defining that middle part of the light. But I find that a little bit odd. It, does, it doesn't quite do it for me. I, I'm not a fan of it. So starting quite often cityscapes with auto, from my point of view, is fine. Of course, by doing that, we have a bit of a risk. Sorry, I'm going in and out. Hopefully no one's getting, uh, getting motion sickness. Um, because on my linear response, I've got a lot more information, as you can see where it says sort of the Fullerton um, over that hotel, um, than with auto. But I can deal with that. So again, it comes back to what we were saying earlier, which is what angle are we coming from? So if I'm happy with this overall contrast, but I know I need to bring the highlights and the, the whites in, well, I can do that with my high dynamic range tool. So let's have a little look at this sign up here, for example. Let's pull in our whites, nice and clear, good. Pull down our highlights if we want, even clearer. And of course, at the same time, that's also brought in our sky. So if I undo that and redo that, now I've got that, um, I guess, that vividness back in the sky that we were talking about in the, initial, or in the original image. So with that done, what do we feel about the tone of the shot? Because to me, and, and again, I, I'm conscious that I tend to lean towards a slightly um, slightly magenta um, cast across images. I know that. It's uh, just part of what I've, what I've always done. Um, the, the image in this one feels to me to be a little bit green. And I'll, I'll tell you why I'm saying that. These buildings here, while glass has a bit of a green tint, this here is concrete. Um, well, no, sorry, it's, um, it's the metal, uh, what do they call it? Cladding, that's it, um, on top of a concrete building. These are concrete pillars here. If I, let's just do our little handy little uh, color readout thing that we've learned today um, and click into here. Well, we can see there's a bit of a shift of blue-ish in there. In this one, quite a big shift of blue in there. Um, and in here, a bit of a shift of green and blue. Um, same here, green and blue um, away from red. Be careful with this because, of course, some of this is by nature of the fact that you're in blue hour. We call it blue hour for that reason. The light in blue hour is not pure daylight, not pure white. So the buildings wouldn't be reflecting pure white daylight colors. But I still don't like it being that green. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I am going to shift our tint a touch. And you see those numbers change as I do it. And that's going away from the green area. And I'm also going to shift our um, white balance, our temperature of light to be a bit warmer too. This is purely personal preference. There is no rule book that says it has to be done like this. But if you look now between the left and the right, that shift between the, the sort of greeny tones of the left-hand side to the more warm, uh, slightly bluish, pinkish, um, I guess, evening tones to me, just in my head um, fit a lot better. So again, personal preference, you can choose, um, but there we go. Right, the rest of our stuff. On a cityscape, we can get away with quite a lot of clarity, but be careful because if I look at this building here, let's go into here. I'm being unfair. We're at 258% right now, but I'm just demonstrating the clarity thing. If I click on this, now look how vivid that's become, which is great. In fact, yeah, let's let's whack this up to 100, you know, level 11, off we go. Um, structure, let's put a bit of that in too. Great, I've now got a, if I just Alt key or the Option key, hold this down um, while I'm pressing the mouse, I can go before and after. Wow, our city's looking a lot more vivid and vibrant now, for sure. But that image looks horrible when I zoom out. So let's go before and after. We've overdefined the clouds. We've overdefined, <coughs> sorry, overdefined this water. 
we've just made the whole thing um sorry that was the hdr tool um the whole thing just a bit too garish a bit too contrasty so that's the the challenge um that you're going to have when you overdo the clarity in the city so what i would do if i wanted to do clarity in the city is actually use a luma range just to identify those darker parts that we really want to make pop so what i can do is i can create a new filled layer go to my luma range and i click on display mask so i can see what i'm doing and then we're going to exclude a lot of the light stuff that was easy um, we can include more of the darks down here we have a bit of a problem with this water because this water is the same luma range remember the luma mask doesn't care about color it just cares about the luminosity of a pixel and we're going to have a bit of a problem here because i can't quite get the right amount of building along with the right amount of water excluded so what we're going to do instead i'm just going to soften the edge of this luma range with the radius what we're going to do instead of course i've got my mask but it's a filled mask and it, the mask behaves separately and independently to the luma range so i can still with this mask go on and erase it so click on my eraser or press e on the keyboard um, we're just going to go across this water and erase the water from my luma mask or from my mask on this picture remember without this luma range all of this sky is still included in that mask so the luma range is excluding the bright parts and I've now, because this is the same brightness as some of those buildings, excluded this from that Luma range by deleting it from the mask, not the Luma range itself. Let's turn the mask off. Now, if I want to add in a bit of clarity, I can. And you see, it doesn't matter how much I put none or a huge amount. It's not going to impact the sky. It's not going to make the water go too crisp. We're not going to overdo it. But it does mean that I can have parts of the image pop. And it's very subtle, just to be clear. It's, it's just adding a bit of micro contrast um, around those dark areas of the buildings. Now, talking about the water, well, we kind of want to make this a little bit less clear, right? So we've got two ways of doing that, funnily enough. Uh, now in version 21, that is. So let's create a new, I'm just in naughty. I'm going to call this one City Skyline Clarity. So I know what it does. Please, please name your layers. Um, and this one we're going to call water softening. Um, I'm going to draw a very, very quick mask. I'm not too worried about uh, whether we go over too much on it. 100% um, opacity, 100% flow, because I just want to get the entire area up here included. And if I do go over a bit that I didn't want, I'm just going to erase it a bit later. So for the purposes of this, that's my mask done. Two ways to soften the water now, which is quite useful. Number one, we can reverse our clarity. So clarity is great as a micro contrast adjustment. It takes areas of the image. Typically around the midtones is where you'll see most of the effect. It's a midtone adjustment in that sense. And what that can do is it can sharpen all of the detail in this water. But if we don't want that sharpening, because the water is actually not quite as smooth maybe as we'd like, well, this is our baseline here at the middle over sharpen or over uh, uh, sorry over contrasted under contrasted so we can actually reduce our clarity in there the second way funnily enough is with our dehaze tool because the dehaze tool allows us to clarify something it is a form of contrast in that sense but it also allows us to declarify something or d or rehaze it let's call it that so I've got two methods of doing this. This one tends to result in a softer, smoother, less colored result. It, it tends to go more into the sort of faded white zone rather than um, using all the reflections of the oranges and yellows and reds and so on. So I'm going to use a touch of that and a touch of reduced clarity. And that just gives me a softer water on that front. And what I might then do, because you can see the overall effect of that, is it's come a little bit a little bit brighter effectively and the reason for that is obviously as we've reduced some of those contrast points yes we've re or removed some of the light high um, reflection specular um, highlights in in the reflections on the water but we've also reduced the dark parts of the water as well so it's given us the effect of a flatter more soft but more gray um, and lighter um, area of water so we're just going to pull our exposure down just by a touch just to compensate for that 
Now, overall, I'm still in a place where I want this to look a little bit more funky. So maybe we go cooler and a bit pinker, maybe there. Yeah, that sort of works for me. Um, and then I might want to just add one other thing, which is a quick gradient across here. Now, this gradient covers the sky and the horizon and the city skyline and some of the water. What I cannot do is just do that with my exposure. That doesn't make sense. It makes it look a little bit like um, I've put a filter on the wrong way onto the camera or I've, I've cut across it. So we're not going to use our exposure to do that. We're going to use our highlight reduction and our white reduction across this mask. So remember that mask has got a nice soft fall off, but it is only affecting the highlights and the whites of this area that is masked. So, right, where are we? Brian's just asked, I'm ignoring David's thing. For those of you that don't know, David is doing a quick live in five minutes. So there you go. Um, I said I was going to ignore it, but I'm not. There you go. Quick advert, Mr. Grover. Um, so in about five minutes, head across to the Capture One channel and you'll see that. Um, Brian's just said, when I added clarity to the buildings, the sky suddenly looks replaced. It, it can be a problem. It can be a side effect if you um, if you push it, as I say, too far. Um, it can it gives you the effect of this being a cutout. Um, so yeah, genuinely, clarity is such a powerful tool. But as they was it with with great power comes great responsibility. Use it in moderation. Don't overdo it. And if you think that's gone too far, then all we're going to do is go to this layer, and that's the reason why we have them as layers, and pull our opacity of that layer down. We can reduce it down to no effect, back to 100%, um, entirely up to you. Um, so that was our top left sky. Remember to name all your layers. But again, we go from, let's just create a new variant. So there was our original. There's our final one. If we want to just lift this image in terms of its, um, its midpoint, what we could do is just put, uh, put a little bit of a boost in our curve. So in other words, let's take the mid-tones up, keep our highlights where they are, and that just lifts it. So if you think about what we've done to the histogram, we've left the shadow point where it was. We've kept our highlights relatively stable up until that three-quarter mark, and then we've put a little bit of a boost um, into the shot in those mid-tones just to give it a bit of pop. Um, ah, actually, ha, funny to say that. Let's go full circle. I did that on the wrong place. I did that on the layer, which is top left sky. I wanted to do that on the background. So just, again, be aware. That's why we have our layers at the top of every screen. Um, if you want to do that, just be careful that you don't do it on the um, on the, the layer, which you've just put a gradient, for example, like I did. And we do it there. So there's our starter. There's our end. Small edits, but we've just softened the water. We've smoothed it out. We've made sure that those buildings are nice and crisp. We've certainly, if I go into here recovered quite a lot of the uh, the highlight detail in there. We've got a lot of the, the wording back. If we look at this stone building up here, we've got a lot of the detail back in there. That's looking nice. Um, and overall, we're all good. Um, so unfortunately today, we've only got through two. Next week, we'll start with this one from Michael. Funnily enough, talking about noise reduction. Um, we're going to cover this one because there's quite a bit of noise in there, Michael. Um, but so, so, so from today, we go from here to here. Bit of color grading, bit of color balance shifting um, for shadows and highlights and so on. But um, overall, minor changes to make quite a big difference overall. And in this one, we go from here uh, to here with that nice smooth water. We've got a lot more detail back in the buildings. We've got the sky detail back. Certainly all these clouds have come a bit more um, to the forefront. And more importantly, hopefully, you're all going to go away today and play with your workspaces Get it set up around you, around the way that you work, not necessarily the default way. If the default way is the way you work, stick with it. But for now, just have a play. Um, see what you can do to, to mold the workspace around you rather than you molding around the workspace. It's one of the most powerful features in there. Okay, everyone. So uh, remember, if we want to carry on any discussions beyond this um, in the meantime, between now and the next session, then we've got that Facebook group. Um, Sorry, I left um, Brian's comment on the on the screen. Uh, let's just get rid of that one. So um, go into that Facebook group. Uh, you can join that group. It's, it's open to people to join. Um, we can carry on that discussion in there for any of these pictures and more, and also some of the stuff around the new versions. Um, remember, you've got the YouTube um, Pro Tips videos that you can download and watch for free whenever you want around certain tools. So things like, uh, funnily enough, uh, HDR tools and clarity and so on is in there. Remember to upload your files to this site, so poreforlive.wetransfer.com. When you do that, remember to include your name, please. Otherwise, we don't know who you are. 
And also remember to send the raw file, not just the JPEG. If you want to send the EIP with all of your adjustments in, then go for it. It's, it's great, it's helpful because it means that I can see what you were thinking as well at the time. And between now and our next session, uh, remember you can get in touch in all of those different ways. And in about one minute, Mr. Grover is online for a quick edit with the Capture One page. So head across to Facebook um, and enjoy that one for the next half hour, I think it is. Um, between now though, take care and we will catch you next time. Cheers, everyone. Bye.